Hello, I'm Jordan, and welcome to this Total War Three Kingdoms Dong Zhuo Let's Play. It is finally time to take a look at the Tyrant, who can be unlocked in your game by reaching the rank of Emperor, or by beating Dong Zhuo on the battlefield at any time. The big man himself is a cruel Tyrant with a hard starting situation. He's at war with almost everyone on the map after raising the capital city, and thus finds himself in a somewhat vulnerable position to begin with. But he does have the Han as his vassals, and arguably gets the best starting economy in the game. His playstyle focuses on oppression and control, and Dong Zhuo benefits from a faction specialization called Intimidation, which is your faction's special currency, as well as exclusive access to medium and heavy shock cavalry from the beginning, and the special Enforced Conscription building chain. He starts with the Sentinel General, Ziang Liao, and of course, the Warrior Without Equal. The Red Mist himself. Alubu! Let's dive straight in. By turn two, it's time to quite literally open the floodgates and get Dong Zhuo himself on the field. If we look at his character tab, you can see that as well as his iconic armor and the blade of Zhang Yu, we can see his traits are mainly yellow and red. Cruel, arrogant, and greedy. Which tells you a lot about the type of person he is, Alongside a multitude of starting skills, his aptly named Reign of Terror ability is no joke, plus 100% base melee damage and armor piercing damage, as well as becoming unbreakable to you and all troops within 50 meters for the cost of only minus 50% melee evasion. All this makes Dong Zhuo nothing short of devastating on the battlefield. Quickly looking at the court panel, Dong Min is our serving faction heir, with Lu Bu as our grand commandant. We have a lot of starting characters available to us, because with Dong Zhuo, there are a number of more advanced mechanics accessible to him from Turn 1. It's springtime of 191 AD, and although the coalition has failed in an attempt to bring me down, my enemies are regrouping. My next steps will be simple. I will rush my nearest foe before he can build up to become a major threat. That enemy is Yuan Shu to my southeast one of the original members of the coalition against me. But success will heavily depend on me being able to force a few diplomatic agreements to make it happen. Let's join Dong Zhuo, who is about to descend upon Hangzhong City. This move is more than just a random act of violence. Tyrants rule by fear, and that fearsome reputation requires a certain amount of upkeep. Just underneath the court panel in the top left of the screen, you can see a clenched fist alongside a three-tier red bar. This bar represents our intimidation and its level in points from 0 to 100. Dong Zhuo's faction lives and dies by this currency. It is a literal measure of the fear people have for me. This currency must be managed, as it automatically decreases little by little every turn, depending on which tier you're in. Acts of aggression or evil, such as raising a settlement to the ground, brutally killing one of my own court members in front of the rest, annexing a Han settlement by force, or just by winning battles, all raise my intimidation. Whereas using a coerce action to force diplomatic success, promoting someone, losing a battle, or losing a settlement all lower my intimidation. Every action I make needs to consider this intimidation level if I'm to keep my iron grip on my empire. So while my intimidation level is strong, I'm going to flex on my vassals. Making a coerce move in diplomacy uses up exactly 30 points from my intimidation bar. Coercion can be used to force just about any political action. Here, I have demanded that the harm put 6.5k cash and a lucrative trade deal on the bargaining table. But why offer them anything of worth for it when I can simply coerce them into handing it over? I need to make a fast, high impact assault early in the campaign here to harness my advantage, and that takes money. By the summer of 191 AD, Han Zhong is looking ripe for the taking, which will earn me a solid 10 points of intimidation. I want to make one more coerce move before launching the attack, but I can't afford to go into the lowest tier of intimidation and suffering the associated penalties. I'm on 49 currently, and I need to get to just under 60, so I think I need to make an example of someone. Someone surplus to requirements. Ni Fu is an overhead I don't need and plays no part in my grander strategy. However, he can serve as a martyr for the cause in this instance. He's going to get the chop, literally. It's worth it to earn the extra intimidation points I need. An execution gives us plus 10 intimidation and plus 250 confiscated funds, but does give us a 5 turn minus 10 satisfaction to all other characters. A worthwhile cost at this time, but not worth repeating too often. Now, 
Let's enter diplomacy again to lock down the support I need from Liu Biao before engaging my real target, Yuan Shu. Liu Biao neighbors Yuan Shu's territory. We have a non-aggression pact with him, as well as a trade agreement too, which makes him a rare potential ally. I'm going to force him into a coalition with me, which achieves two things. It protects any Han provinces near Liu Biao and focuses his war efforts on Yuan Shu before I get there. When the time comes, we may well be able to take on Yuan Shu together. After that, I'll reassess Liu Biao's usefulness to me. Now it's time to descend on Han Zhong and remind everyone who's boss. We engage Zhang Lu on the tree-covered foothills of the mountains, Han Zhong in sight in the distance behind us. They have ranged superiority on us here, but the trees actually play to our advantage on that front, providing some natural cover. It's the winter of 191. The victory over Han Zhong is behind us, but what it did cost us is my faction heir, Dong Min, who fell during the battle. I will not allow nor spare the time for grieving. Lu Bu, my Grand Commandant, is the obvious choice. A real warrior, worthy of carrying on my legacy. I will promote him to be my new faction heir. I will muster him a magnificent army, worthy of my banner, and let him loose, cutting a bloody path through the bandits of the Black Mountains in the east, crushing them as a threat. I will lead Dong Zhuo on the long journey down the Shangyong Valley, annexing as I go to maintain my intimidation. My aim is to strike at the heart of Yuan Chu's empire, Nanyang, and burn it to the ground. A few turns on, and by harvest season of 192, Lu Bu has managed to catch Zhen Jiang unaware and worn down as she sieges a Han fishing port in Yi. She runs in fear of what's to come, but Lu Bu is unrelenting and gives chase. He quickly wins the battle. He has a huge numbers advantage. I choose to annex the fishing port to regain some troops. But, I purely wish for Lu Bu to cause havoc here and find fights, gaining the intimidation. Zhen Zhang retreats to Yi Town proper, and instead of pursuing her, I set an ambush just outside of it, guarding the river crossing, waiting to see if I could catch her or anyone else unaware in my trap. After several seasons travel, Dong Zhuo is finally in place as the winter of 192 AD sets in, and I move forward, taking position on Nanyang. I'm halted in my tracks though. Yuan Shu has moved up and taken position in a forward encampment, cutting off my route to the city. The battle favours him too much for me to be foolhardy enough to engage him here while he has the advantage. Across the way, in Yi, Lu Bu comes up trumps again. I clearly said I wanted Lu Bu to go out and cause havoc, and that's exactly what he has done. Firstly, wounding Zhen Zhang, and now Zhang Yan falls into my trap as well as he attempts to cross the Yellow River into my territory in the desert. They would have done better working together. To fight Lu Bu in standard combat is one thing, but to face him unprepared as he closes in around you from all sides with the fury of over 200 heavy and medium shot cavalry to his name? The result wasn't pretty. Another trophy for Lu Bu as the King of the Black Mountains joins the scores of those who have fell to his blade. A baptism of blood and fire to begin his reign as my adopted son and heir, truly worthy of the Dong dynasty. Back in Nanyang, spring is on the horizon and I move Dong Zhuo towards the city. I'm just short of the movement I need, but it might just be enough to draw Yuan Shu out into open combat. Finally, the snake emerges. Yuan Shu has to take on the fight before my coalition reinforcements in Liu Biao's army arrive. The battle is truly close, but yet again, it's my shot cavalry that I owe this victory to. Combining clever use of guerrilla deployment with good flanking enabled them to cause maximum disruption to Yuan Shu's copious ranged backlines. Yuan Shu survives the battle, but is undoubtedly about to lose the war. Next turn, supported by Liu Biao's forces, we close in on Nanyang and deliver the killing blow. That treacherous Ker Yuan Shu is delivered to me after the battle, and as a man of my word, I execute him without hesitation and burn Nanyang to ashes. It can serve as a symbol, not far from the embers of Liu Yang. The first part of my conquest is complete. And what would you know? Dao Chan and I are to be married. It seems like everything's coming up Dong Zhuo. Thanks very much for watching.